Next, we have Timothy. Close enough. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Um, Don't be. Timothy is an information security and privacy researcher. Um, he is the CEO and co founder of Black Bear InfoSec, which I believe he's wearing on his shirt. That's a really sweet <laughs> shirt. Um, and, which is an information consulting company. Um, security. Wow, words. Um, <laughs> While Tim has years of experience in incident response, red teaming, and threat hunting, his true passion is putting on his tinfoil hat and helping people defend their privacy. In his spare time, he enjoys amateur radio and data hoarding projects. Thanks. Hey, how's everyone doing today? That's more lively than I expected it to in the afternoon after lunch, so sweet. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about what we do in the shadows going dark with consumer electronics. Um, just to sort of piggyback on what uh, Austin was saying, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a co-founder of Black Bear InfoSec. Fun fact, it's really easy to be CEO of your own company. You just need $200 and you fill out a form with the state and now you're a CEO. Super easy. Never thought it would be. Um, I also wear a bunch of tinfoil hats and you can find me on Twitter. I like to talk about privacy, data hoarding, and 2000s emo post-punk. So if you want to talk about that, find me. Um, Fall Out Boy forever. Um, so let's talk an overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about some concepts. We're going to go through a toolkit, then walk through a practical example about what we're talking about, um, some next steps you can take. And if we have time, uh, we'll do a Q, little Q&A session. Uh, otherwise, I'll be around. So first, though, I want to start off with story time. Recently, my wife and I purchased a new home. And with that home came one of these lovely things, a Nest thermostat, right? So I get poking and prodding around. I'm like, OK, let's set this Nest thermostat up, right? And the first thing it asks you is, well, we need to know your address. And we need to know your phone number. And we need to know your blood type. And we need to know the, your mother's maiden name. And I'm like, wait a minute. Why do they need all this information? What's happening with all this information? What, else, what other devices am I using that they're getting this same information, right? Well, apparently, everything is connected to the internet, and everything requires an account. Right? But I want to use all this cool stuff. So how do you use all this cool stuff, and what do they do with, their da with your data? Well, um, not, it's not great, right? <laughs> it's not great. So how do you use it? Don't use it. Questions? I got <laughs> anyone? Right, OK. That's not going to work, because I need a Wi-Fi microwave, and I want to use my smart fridge, and I want to look at my kids and my dog while I'm at work, because I can't just call my wife, right? So let's talk about going dark for a minute, right? So all of these services, they require an account. They're gathering personal information on you. When we talk about going dark, what we're talking about is eliminating the amount of actual information about you that we're giving to these companies. You know what? Let me fix this real quick, because I can't see my next slides. That's not the button I wanted. Cool. Right. So pretty much everything requires that you have an account. So this is where we're going to defeat a lot of the data gathering. So let's talk a concept real quick. We have you, right? And then we have your devices and your bank accounts and your credit cards, right? And then we have everything that you pay for, all the services that you're using with these devices and everything that you want to be able to do with these devices. And what happens is you're using your credit card, you're using the app that comes with the service, you're using your computer to check all these services. It creates a really good profile of who you are and what you're doing with these devices. Well, what I'm proposing today is we sort of firewall them off, right? So instead of one person and one identity, and that's you, you're going to have one person with multiple identities that you can use across all these services and eliminate having to give out your actual information. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we need some essentials. And the first thing we need is a cell phone. Um, I got people walking here. Question, real quick, because I want to know how much flack I'm going to get for this next statement. How many people are using an iPhone in this room? Oh, you're going to hate me. OK, so <laughs> for this next step, um, uh, I should clarify, there's a difference between secure and private, right? 
I am not debating whether Android and iPhone are more secure than one another. However, I will say that while Google is really great about being secure, they're not super great about being private, right? So, uh, and one of the apps that we're gonna be talking about is only available on iOS currently. So that's why I'm gonna recommend an iPhone for this. So you're gonna have to get a new phone. You can't use a device that you've already filled with your personal data and your phone number to do these next steps. Otherwise, it defeats the whole purpose. Your IMEI is already in some database. Your phone number and your payment information for your cell phone provider, that's already in some database. So we gotta start, we gotta scorch the earth and start from scratch. So you're probably like, Tim, but an Apple device is so much money. It's so expensive. Um, all right, it's not gonna be the latest and greatest, but you can go to Target today and pick one of these up cash. That's the other important thing about this, cash, for about 150 to 200 bucks, which I would argue is not a lot to pay to get your privacy back. Next thing we're gonna need is a new phone number because we don't wanna keep using the phone number we've been using because that's in a bunch of services. And if anyone, uh, anyone of you are on your laptops right now, Google your phone number and see how much information comes up about you. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna start from scratch there as well. Uh, and your phone number really isn't gonna matter and we'll find out why in some next steps. Um, what I would recommend is Mint. I am not sponsored by them. Um, but Mint SIM, you can pick up. They do not require real information in order to sign up for their service. They also allow you to sign up with a prepaid gift card. So it's prepaid, um, and you don't have to worry about actually giving them your real information. So um, you can pick up one of these. There are some other options. You can go to T-Mobile and get a prepaid SIM there. They don't really care because um, they're getting their money up front. So great, we got our new phone. We got our new phone number. We haven't given that phone number out to anyone. Do not use that phone number. We'll talk why in a minute, but we, we're gonna get started with our toolkit. So the first thing we're gonna need is email, because we can't use the one that we've been using that's already considered burnt. Consider everything that you already have existing burnt. So we're gonna need a private email. So we're gonna wanna go with a privacy-focused provider. We're not gonna wanna use Gmail or Yahoo or Live or Outlook. We want a privacy-focused provider. Now, privacytools.io has a great list of everything that you can get. Um, that they've vetted. Uh, my recommendation is going to be these top three, ProtonMail, Disroot.org, or, oh dear lord, Tadanota, I think is how it's pronounced. I've never actually had to say that out loud. Um, they all offer free tier services, so you don't have to pay for it, although you should support these privacy-focused providers. Um, but you're going to pick one of those, and you're going to set up a new account, right? So with that new account, it, do not make it tied to you. So don't use like soccer chick 72 or you know, uh, you wanna make, it, you almost wanna use a password generator for this email and make that your email address. Don't worry, you're not gonna be giving it out to people. Um, you're gonna wanna secure it with a password in 2FA. Um, if you're not using a password manager, none of this information is gonna be really relevant to you because you can't protect something that I can just guess the password for. <laughs> um, and finally, we're not gonna use it anywhere. Don't give it out to anyone. We're gonna get to it in, an, in a later step. Um, so all that's important right now is that you have it. So we have a private email. Next tool we're gonna talk about is called Blur. Blur is a private uh, email masking service. They offer a couple other masking options. Um, but primarily what they'll let you do is create masked emails. Now, how do those emails get to you? Um, they're gonna actually be able to forward your email, the emails they receive from their uh, unique email addresses that you generate, they're gonna forward that to the pri private email address you just set up. So now we're able to create an email on a per service, per device basis uh, that's not directly tied to us. So we've already eliminated one, uh, one key ID that these companies are using. The question you should be asking through all of this, um, and especially of me since I'm providing this information, is why should you trust this information from me or why should you trust these companies? I encourage all of you, question me, question these companies, read their privacy policies. Um, I've already gone through Blur uh, and pulled out some uh, snippets, but if you want at the end, I have a resources page when B-Sides makes the slides available. You'll be able to crawl through all this information yourself and sort of come to your own conclusions. I encourage you to do that. Um, but why should you trust Blur? This is the type of information they're collecting. Basically, they know what email addresses you created and what 
what they're being used for. So they're able to tell what, uh, what email is getting sent to those addresses. That's pretty much it. Great, so now we have a private email that no one has. We have per service email addresses. What's next? Well, we need to be able to pay for stuff. And ironically, this next tool is called privacy. Privacy allows you to create single use and uh, per vendor uh, credit cards that function and work just like normal credit cards that get tied to your bank account. That way, the purchaser doesn't have to have any of your real info. So when you go to make a purchase online, you don't have to give them your actual information. You can be Jane Doe and provide, I always give them like a, uh, a billing address in La Cienega that's like a Del Taco. Um, <laughs> so you don't have to give them your real info. More importantly, your bank doesn't know what you bought. So that's another great thing. Your bank is never going to know what you bought. Uh, my bank, for example, thinks that I buy everything at the NSA gift shop. All my groceries, <laughs> all my clothing, my dry cleaning, my car payments, all through the NSA gift shop. They're like, you really shop there a lot. I'm like, don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, so why should you trust privacy? Well, privacy is making money the same way every other company uh, that processes credit cards is making money. They're getting a transaction fee, they're getting their share of the pie, so they're inclined to trust your private, or to, they're inclined to keep your information private. Okay, so we've conquered three things. We have email, we have payments, what's next? This is the king of all, we need a phone number, and for that, we're gonna be using MySudo. So what is MySudo? It allows you to create multiple identities and phone numbers and emails. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you're allowed to create phone numbers that are local to your area code or someone else's area code. And it allows us to uh, separate out what we're doing. Um, and when we walk through the practical example, this is gonna make a bit more sense. It also allows for dialing out to non MySudo numbers. That's important here. Uh, you don't have to pay to call someone that doesn't have MySudo. Whereas with like a Google Voice service or some of these other voice services, if you dial out, that's an additional fee. None of that. So I can call my grandma who doesn't have my sudo from my my sudo number. Um, this is what's going to replace your primary phone number. So you're going to create your first ID. That's going to be your new phone number. Uh, and that's the one you're going to give out to your friends and family. Then you're going to go in and create another one, and that's what you're going to use for your shopping. And then you're going to go create another one, and that's what you're going to use for your IoT devices at home. That way, you've eliminated your phone number as a possibility to pivot on. Why trust my sudo? Again, they have a privacy policy. I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at it and read it. Um, but what about my old phone number? You know, this is a question that's going to come up a lot. Um, you have an old phone number. You don't want to let that number back into the pool. You don't want to let that number go back into the pool of phone numbers. Uh, because then someone else could get your phone number and I'm assuming you've signed up for services and your bank knows your phone number and I know I get texts from my insurance provider on my phone number. You don't want that number getting assigned to someone else in a week and then them getting texts that were actually meant for you. So we need to do something with this old phone number. This is the only time I'm going to recommend a Google service. Um, Google Voice, again, we're not this phone number's already burned, so we're not necessarily worried about privacy. What we're worried about is making sure that this number is secure. So transfer your old phone number to Google Voice, and hope, I'm assuming you already have a Gmail account or something. What will wind up happening is uh, if you go and create a new Gmail account and try to port your number over, they're going to think it's a spam, uh, a, a spam number, uh, and they're going to probably kick you out, which has happened to me a couple times. Um, so you're going to want to use a Gmail account that you've already been using, uh, and you're going to port your number over to there. Do not install the app on your device. Uh, what you're going to want to do is check it every once in a while and slowly move the people that are texting and contacting that number over to your new private phone number. Great. So we have our toolkit. Well, Let's bring all these pieces together, because I'm assuming that some of this is going to be a little out there, right? Let's pull this all together. So this is where we started. This is where we want to be, right? So let's work with an echo, for example. So an echo, 
needs an Amazon account in order to function the way it's intended to. This is where Blur comes in. So we're going to create a masked email address and use it to create a new account without using our actual info. So we're going to create our names John Doe. We have our Blur email. We're going to give it a strong password. Blur is going to forward that to my Proton mail address. And then we're going to be able to verify the email. And you can see here, John Doe verified email with our password. Great. Next, we're going to want to set up some sort of two-factor authentication. So we're going to use my sudo. And we're going to go ahead, and I'm from Pittsburgh, by the way. Any Yinzers out there? Yeah, OK, nice, dope. Um, <laughs> We're going to go ahead and create a new phone number. And this is where you would create your new ID. And then you can see the phone number was able to receive the verification code from Amazon. So now we have a phone number that we aren't directly attached to in use with Amazon. Now we need to make payments on Amazon, because that's like 90% of using Amazon is buying stuff you don't need at 2 in the morning, right? So you want to be able to yell at your Echo. Hey, uh, hey uh, Alexa, you know, get me uh, only Lucky Charms marshmallows, and I need that prime shipped, right? So you're going to want to attach uh, a credit card. So that's where privacy.com comes in. You can create a credit card, and this is one I actually sent up on my account. Uh, go ahead and use it. Try to, at least. Um, whoever uses it first gets 10 bucks. Um, I doubt it will work. But we went ahead and created, uh, created a a uh, single-use credit card for Amazon. And you can see we verified it. I'm also Elliot Anderson. And that is a, I want to say that's a, uh, a Burger King in Los Angeles. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's going to work anyway. So great, now we have our Echo Plus set up. And now we have us, me, Tim. We also have Jane Doe, or, or I'm sorry, John Doe and or Elliot Anderson with his credit card, his phone number, and his Amazon Echo. And then it's going to be a lather, rinse, repeat for all the other devices in your, uh, in your household. So let's talk about cons, because we're at a con, and we need to talk about cons. Um, I was working on that joke until like 2 AM last night. Don't worry. <laughs> all right. Number one con, not all services like disposable phone numbers, OK? Uh, a lot of uh, the big one that I know about is Facebook. Fun fact, though, Twitter will accept these numbers right through. So that new thing where if you sign up for a Twitter account and you're required to provide a phone number, uh, don't give them your real phone number. You can just use this. Uh, the other con is not all retailers are going to accept these card, the gift cards for purchase that are created by privacy. The big one I know of is PayPal. Um, my, recommend, my recommendation is don't use it. I'm sorry, I don't have a better, I don't have a better answer for you there. Just don't use it, sorry. Um, one of the, this is probably the biggest con of all, is it adds complexity to your life. Because instead of managing just you and your credit cards and your phone number and your computer, you now are essentially managing like four or five other imaginary people and all their likes and dislikes um, and all their information. And it does add a level of complexity. Um, uh, like if I died tomorrow, my wife would be locked out of all of our accounts. Uh, she is not getting into anything. <laughs> um, and then pro finally, the, the other big con is privacy fatigue. This can get exhausting. Um, because instead of being able to just sign up for a service that you want to try out or sign up for an app that you want to try out, there's a rigmarole. And it can get exhausting. But I would argue that your privacy is worth it. Also, caveat, if you ever receive a notification from a three-letter agency, I cannot help. None of this is helping you. Not your own, forget it, don't, don't come to me crying. I can't help you there. Um, so that's the other. This is more like companies that are trying to make money, not a government agency. So next steps, right? So we've, we've moved our life away from some of these big services. But I'm sure some of you are looking at me like, well, Tim, well, there's a couple other things they could track you on. And I'm aware of that. Um, <laughs> 
but I didn't really have time to cram that all into this talk. We'd be here for four hours. So let's talk some brief high-level alternatives. Self-host all the things as far as services are concerned. Uh, if you have a spouse that's willing to let you put a server rack in your garage um, and ruin the roof of the garage in doing so, go with the grace of God, enjoy, be happy. Um, if you can afford it, self-host as much as you can. There are a lot of tools that will allow you to connect your Alexas, your HomePods, your Google Homes uh, to self-hosted services, and Google Home will be none the wiser. Next is your computer, uh, your physical computer. You can be profiled by the computer that you are using. My recommendation is go pick up a 10-year-old computer. Why a 10-year-old Lenovo? This is an X220. It's my favorite computer. Um, you can do what's called core booting these, which basically removes all the proprietary Intel crap that they've included in the BIOS by default. You can rip all of that out, including, most importantly, the Intel management engine. Uh, you can do it with other computers. Go ahead and try. Um, it didn't work out well for me. These are the easiest ones to core boot. That's why I recommend them. And they're dirt cheap. There's hundreds of these. The other thing is the OS that you install on this computer. Uh, Windows 10 doesn't care about you at all. And Mac OS seems to forget how passwords work. So <laughs> Linux. I'm going to be that guy. Put in, install Linux. Well, what kind of Linux? Because there's 800 flavors. Um, and if you feel like smacking your head against the wall, you can figure it out yourself. Um, if you want to talk later, I can talk to you about installing Gen 2 on a 386. <laughs> and it took 10 days. I'll never do it again. Um, my recommendations, Debian, a hardened Debian instance, uh, is probably the easiest thing to set up and manage. Um, if you want to go like next level tinfoil hatter, Cubes OS is the best. Uh, it allows you to do with your computer what we basically did with our lives. That bar gra or that graph where we had the uh, all the different uh, anonymous identities. Uh, it will allow you to spin up different cubes for different purposes. So you'd have a mini PC for your banking info. You'd have a mini PC for your shopping. You'd have a mini PC for chat apps and IRC, and then you'd have uh, what every guy in the room will probably have, which is another one for porn. Um, you can separate all that out. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, next is going to be your IP address, because uh, that's another thing they can peg on. You can anonymize as much as you want. But if everything's coming from this, uh, the same IP address, they're going to be able to sort of figure it out. That's why a VPN, I'm sure everyone already has one. Uh, if I could make a recommendation, uh, private internet access would be the only one on this slide that I actually recommend. And the only reason for that is there is case law in the United States behind it. So they've been challenged by the US courts to provide information on their users. And they've said, OK, here's nothing, because we don't have anything. So that will anonymize you and even like one step further. Let's keep going. DNS providers. You can build your own DNS provider. That's fun. That's a great afternoon. Don't, don't do that. There are privacy-based DNS providers that you can leverage. The next is communication. So you're going to want to anonymize your communications. If you're a, a, is anyone here a green bubble boy? No? That's if you're on iPhone. Android users show up as green bubbles. We call them green bubbles. No one? Cool. That joke went over like a lead balloon. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've all heard the adage, use Tor, use Signal. You can use Signal. There's Wire. There's Telegram. Uh, the EFF is, has an article about selecting a uh, secure communication channel messenger. Uh, they're going to do a better job explaining that than I ever could in the allotted amount of time. The next, and this is the most difficult one and deserves a talk on its own, and I still am having problems with, is home address. Because if you're using any of these services and you're giving them your home address, you need to have stuff shipped there for whatever reason, or they need to send you mail or company. I haven't fully figured out how to anonymize my home address. What I have been doing is using address, an address that I was previously attached to and shipping stuff there. 
It's not a foolproof solution because they can still sort of figure out who you are based on that information. Um, but if anyone wants to talk about that and figure that out with me after this, I'd be willing to, I'm more than willing to hear you out. Um, resources. This is the resources page I was talking about. Everything that I've talked about here, the slides at the very beginning where I called out all those news articles, all the privacy policies, those are here. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't recommend the Privacy, Security, and OSINT show. Um, the gentleman, I can't remember his full name. I think his name is like Michael. And I think that's the point. He doesn't want you to know his last name. Um, he has forgotten more about OSINT. Pardon? Is that who it is? Michael Basil? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Michael Basil. Um, he has forgotten more about, uh, you know, OPSEC than I will ever be able to comprehend. Uh, and he's an invaluable resource. And I, I, I would feel bad if I didn't include this slide. Um, questions? Yes? Uh, what about throwaway email addresses like the YOP mail? You can use those, but they're not going to be consistent. So um, I'm not familiar with YOP mail, but I know like Gorilla Mail, where you're able to just generate a one time email. Those are great for if you don't have to have a service that you're going to continue to use because those email addresses get recycled. You mentioned uh, putting your old number to Google Voice. Yes. And referring people to the new number so you contact them there. Yes. Do you refer to bringing the information through Google Voice's service, or do you use another channel? So that's a great question. You can use Google's Voice's service because they've already contacted you, so they know about that point of contact. And you can say, hey, I'm, I've moved to a new device. Here's my new phone number. You can do it there. Um, it, that's really not a, a big deal because if they're contacting you, Google already knows about that communication. So, so you, you mentioned your new number and that communication going over to Google. That's actually a good one. That's a good one. I hadn't thought about that. Um, no. You, you ask for their number, text them through screen. Hey, I'll text you for my new number. Yeah. That's. The reason why I left so much time for Q&A is because I very much believe in what I, I consider adversarial peer review. So <laughs> as much as this is me giving you guys information, this is as much like testing my OPSEC to see where I need to improve. So that's actually a good tip. And when I give this talk again, I'll make sure to include that. Let me get your Twitter information. Yes? Are you able to load cubes on a Lovano X2220? Yes. Yes. You do need to make sure that you put a lot of RAM into that computer. How much RAM were you able to put in it? That's uh, an old machine. It is an old machine, but you can still cram 16 gigs in that bad boy. So you cram 16 gigs in? Mm-hmm. You can. It will run fine on 8 gigs, but you can cram 16 gigs in there without a problem. And then cubes runs nice. Smooth as butter. Anyone else? Oop. Uh, I just had a question about the privacy.com gift cards. Yes. Yes. So if the vendor believes that the credit card company kind of authorized the exact billing address, when you go ahead and submit the card number, they mm -hmm. don't believe that's your address as well. Yes. Issue. Yes. So you don't, it, privacy will authenticate any billing information that you submit because the idea is you've already had to go in and create the card on your account. Uh, so they don't really care what information gets passed to them. They'll just go ahead and approve it as long as it meets the criteria. So uh, the card isn't canceled and it's a, uh, below the approved limit. Go ahead and let that transaction go through. In the back. As far as I know, yes, uh, because they need to be able to keep tra they need to be able to keep uh, track of transactions that are occurring. Uh, but again, that's why I encourage you to read their privacy policy. Um, they haven't, this is the, I will say this, they haven't, from what I've found, had that tested. Um, so that's something to consider. Hi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was just curious. Um, you mentioned a bit about trying to anonymize a home address. Yes. Um, what, obviously it wouldn't be foolproof and completely anonymized. Um, what are your thoughts on P.O. Box? That's what I was just 
Mm -hmm. P.O. boxes have to be tied to real information uh, because it's the U.S. government. Uh, let me give you my working theory on anonymizing your home address. It does require purchasing a new home. Uh, <laughs> so it's not really going to be great. But if you're in the market for a new home, this is going to be great for you. You can actually create an LLC in New Mexico with a P.O. box. And then that you can use to create a trust. And then you purchase the home in the name of the trust. And then that uh, puts enough distance between you and the hot. It's not real fleshed out. That's why it's not in here. <laughs> yes, sir? Wouldn't it be easier just to live in a van? It absolutely would. And if you want to hear about, that's actually called Privacy Nomads. And if you want to hear a great talk about Privacy Nomads, go check out the uh, podcast that I just recommended, whose name I completely forget already. Um, hang on. This one. Um, they, have a, they have a pair. Uh, they have a couple, a couple couples. Uh, that are actually privacy nomads. So they live in a van, they don't have a permanent address uh, for the sake of privacy. Not the lifestyle for me. Yes? You mentioned the computers uh, removing the access to what the fuck was called? I'm um, sorry, run that one by me again. Oh, um, core booting. Yeah, core, okay. I call it core booting. It's actually the, the uh, project is called core boot. Uh, and it's a uh, continuation of another awesome project called LibreBoot. Um, and I would recommend LibreBoot, but unless you want to use a computer that came out uh, when you were in high school, yeah, it's not really effective. Um, X220s, X230s, those are probably the most modern computers that I've been able to find that you can easily and successfully core boot on a regular basis. Yes? Yes. Uh, I would like to highlight a company called uh, Purism, um, and they they sell laptops that um, are core booted with actually a fairly modern uh, Intel processor. Is what we're talking like very recent. That is absolutely true. There is uh, a company called Purism, as he was saying. They do sell these really great computers. Uh, the only reason I didn't bring them up, cost again. Uh, yeah, cost is 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 a problem. Uh, the other thing I will mention while we're on the topic of core boot is. Uh, You'll see I'm using a Mac. Uh, and I just got done extolling the virtues of privacy, yet I have a Mac computer. Uh, there's a lot of things that Linux does great. There's a lot of things that Linux doesn't do great. Um, and Keynote is one of those things. <laughs> Anyone else? In the back in the blue? Absolutely. So I don't like, I wouldn't willingly put a microphone in my home, I guess is number one. However, I think you should still be able to, if you want to, you should still be able to use some of these devices. And this is a way to go about doing that where not all of that data is going to be correct. Yeah, it's going to be your voice, but they don't know it's, Tim talking, they're going to think it's Joe or Dave or whoever, whatever information you've provided on that account. So that's, that's sort of where that is. Uh, you know, a lot of this, I know that these are devices that are going to breach privacy. Uh, but I don't think that means you can't, I don't think you should be uh, handcuffed by privacy and not have the ability to use some of these. Because some of this stuff is really cool. I can make my living room blue and then red with the flick of a button and it's so cool. <laughs> I want to be able to do that, but I don't want to give up all my information in order to do that. Yes? But on the privacy policies, because it's in there today, it doesn't mean it's going to be there tomorrow. And you still don't know what they're doing. And then the biggest thing that we don't even have any control over really much about is if they get hacked and they still want to use information. That's just silly. Absolutely. And I guess my, my uh, caveat to that is at least they're trying. Um, whereas like Gmail and, and Target and all these other companies, sorry, <laughs> um, all these other companies, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not hiding it. You, you know, they're, they're open about doing it. Um, and at some point you're going to have to trust someone upstream. Uh, and at least these companies are making an effort. 
Yes. Um, so when taking like a, an email provider, for example, um, you know, some of the examples you have there, they're located in different countries. Yes. So of course they're governed, governed by those different countries. Do you have any opinion on like, you know, when looking for services like email or something, deciding based on countries, like what countries are good for your privacy, which ones are, are not as good? So this is going to be, I think I get where you're going. I, this is going to be sort of based on your quote unquote threat model, right? Um, for you personally. Uh, my recommendation, because it's the easiest one to give, especially for people, you're not hiding from a government. You're hiding from companies hiding. Um, just stay out of the five eyes as much as you can. That's, that's pretty much, and all those companies that I recommended on that slide, those are all outside the five eyes. Yes? So let's say I run one of these identities through um, any old kind of framework, mm -hmm. right? Um, have you tried, well, first of all, have you tried doing that, what you get, and what happens when you correlate um, all those different uh, uh, identities and put them in uh, where essentially you're running a, a, a search on yourself to see, hey, how effective is, is this? Is anything able to, to be traced back to me? Specifically, I mean, everything that's uh, uh, government-based, like if you want to live out of a car, mm -hmm. that car still has to be registered to a person or a corporation, that corporation. Uh, there's many layers of obfuscation. Uh, obfuscation that you can do on that. Absolutely. But have you ever tried that? How far did you get? What are the pitfalls? So, um, uh, real quick, as I know about the car, the car is going to fall under the same thing as the home one in that it's doable, but you have to buy a new car. <laughs> so that's going to be out of the round. Like that's going to be like, oh, when I buy a new car, I'll have to remember this information. As far as like running OSINT on yourself. Uh, so here's the thing, if you're in this talk, chances are you're already concerned that your information is out there. Uh, and what really codified, like, I need to lock down my OPSEC is, uh, have you ever heard of mylife.com? That is a terrifying website. Um, <laughs> basically what they do is they buy data from all these companies and then put it all into one nice little mishmash of like, hey, here's a profile of Tim. Um, the new identities that I've created, I run through them like you're supposed to change your uh, smoke alarm batteries like every six months. Um, it just sort of becomes a, a running habit. Uh, that's going to be something you're going to want to get used to doing is doing some OSINT on yourself and figuring out what you can find about your new identities. As far as your old identity is concerned, the one that you've been using, your phone number, your address, all that other information. Uh, I can recommend a workbook that's online that will walk you through getting your information removed from these services. Uh, so my life, um, I think there's like whitepages.com, all those are collecting information that has been sold to them from marketing companies and, and uh, the services that you're using uh, and collated together. There's a workbook you can go through and actually have them remove that. Uh, and that's another thing that you're going to have to keep up with. That all goes back to that privacy f fatigue and complexity. It's an ongoing thing. It's not a set it and forget it. I hope that answers your question. Yes? I'm kind of curious what your uh, network configuration at home is like. Um, I can sum it up uh, with the words of my four-year-old daughter, who <laughs> routinely says, Daddy's fixing the internet. Um, <laughs> so uh, my network is a disaster, um, but in a good way. It's complex, <laughs> probably more complex than it needs to be because I do run like a couple labs. It's not your basic flat network. Um, I mean, I can talk about that all day, but I don't think anyone wants to hear that anyways. <laughs> we can, I, yeah, absolutely. So um, my, on my edge, I run PFSense. Is anyone familiar with that? Yeah, perfect, awesome. So I run PFSense. That runs my tunnel through private internet access. Um, it does mean that my internet takes a bit of a bandwidth hit, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to give that up. Um, my ISP doesn't have any of my real information, and it has a privacy.com email address, or uh, privacy.com card on file for payment. Uh, so they don't have any of my actual information. Uh, when the guy came out, he's like, I'm looking for Craig. And my wife is like, no, Craig lives here. I'm like, sweetie, no, 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 I'm Craig. <laughs> 
Um, from there, I pretty much, if you have a Gmail service or a Google service or an Apple service that you're using to organize your life from calendars to contacts to your drive to Netflix, I have a self-hosted version of all of that. Um, and as he, as, I, as he mentioned in my bio, I'm also a data hoarder. So I have about 40 terabytes of storage at home just sitting in a rack somewhere that I ruined my garage to put in. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's where I pretty much keep everything um, with the exception of my backups because I don't keep backups on site. Those go to a colo server in Sweden, uh, which actually now that I think about it, I need to call their remote hands because it's offline. Uh, anyone else? <laughs> yes? Not that I've seen. Um, that is actually a great point. A lot of these, uh, like when I explain that, like I explained to my coworkers, like, hey guys, my phone number changed. Also, my address isn't my address anymore. Uh, a lot of them go, are you selling, are you selling drugs? I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I'm just hyper paranoid. Um, but that is that should be something that's on your radar. Is a lot of the same techniques that you can use to go dark with these companies. Um, bad actors also use the same techniques to hide. You know, uh, so that's just something you should be on your radar. If you're not worried about being targeted by a three-letter organization, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be that concerned. Yes? Uh, was there a verification you had an issue with? For email or for the credit cards? Uh, like, I work on PayPal verification. Yeah. So Yeah. So uh, PayPal is the big one that has caused me the most guff because they want actual information, uh, and it's gotten to the point where like they're like, you need to send us your drive, like a scanned copy of your driver's license, so that we can verify that you live at you know two one two Rodeo Drive, Beverly Hills nine zero two one zero. I do not live there, and neither does my driver's license say any of that information. So that's the one. That's like I said, the one of the cons is. Uh, PayPal just doesn't like not having true information. And that's because they're using that for something. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact phrasing you used. Um, how do you, I guess, mitigate your privacy exhaustion or what was it? Uh, privacy fatigue. Thanks. Um, I open up Google News. <laughs> <laughs> And I just type in data breach. No, I mean, it is, <laughs> it is absolutely tiring, and it will make you go insane. And you're going to screw up your OPSEC eventually. Um, I mentioned I have kids. There's a trampoline park near our house. We go there. For some reason, they need my email address, my phone number, and my, uh, my date of birth in order for me to sign their um, warranty or whatever that my kids, if my kids get dismembered, they are, I won't sue. Um, and when you have two screaming kids and you're like, I just need to sign this paper so I can shut them up as quickly as possible, uh, you're going to put in your actual email address. It's just going to happen. Um, but again, it's sort of like you got to remember that this is all moving towards making sure that you are in control of your information. Um, and if you can reframe that every once in a while, I think it's helpful. Absolutely. So you can actually use this to your advantage. A lot of companies uh, will automatically sell your information the moment you give it to them. One of the big ones, uh, if you want to start doing some disinformation on your own and you got five bucks laying around, sign up for, Wired's, uh, mag for Wired Magazine. Give them fake information at your actual home so they you can start getting some information about who lives at your current address out there. Uh, and within like three or four days, you'll start receiving junk mail in that name uh, that you gave to Wired.com. And I think you can do it with like Forbes and GQ and all the, I get like eight copies of different magazines because I have them signed up with like different names and different uh, identities. 
So if anyone needs a copy of Wired Magazine, <laughs> hit me up. <laughs> yes, sir. I do not. I don't like having cameras in my house. Uh, I have a hard time having pictures of me. This is probably the only time that I'm actually going to be like recorded. Uh, it's a big point of contention with my wife explaining to her. It's like, no, don't post me on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this angle's awful, so you're okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, you're getting the nice side profile too. Yeah. Yes. What social media platforms do you stay away from? Uh, everything but Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter all the time. Um, I used to have Instagram, uh, but that was like all that information was fake, with the exception of the pictures I was posting, which you'll have to strip all the metadata out of, which was like, like this is exhausting, and I don't need to see another post by Shane Dawson. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this. <laughs> so do you have any opinions on the like, newer federated social media platforms like Mastodon, Blur? haven't had a chance to dig into those. Uh, and part of that is like user mass. You know, there's not, they're not as big and as connected as say like a Twitter. Not that they aren't good. I don't want, I don't want anyone to like stop working on Mastodon. Um, but I'm waiting for that to really see how it fleshes out. Anybody on Mastodon? I'm just going to throw it out super quick. We have five minutes left. Five minutes? Awesome. I mean, I'm going to be here all day, <laughs> so if uh, we can we can keep talking elsewhere. Yes, I'll take two. I'll take these last two, and then we'll be good. So with uh, AI and uh, automatic uh, face recognition, and even if you put on a fake nose or you know, like when we all go to DEF CON, yeah, we're automatically mapped. I even saw um, on the crossing the street. Yeah. You know, a random guy just with uh, Nikon, just like this. Yeah. Right? Taking pictures automatically at, at that bottleneck. Um, what would you do to more or less mitigate that? And by trying to obscure yourself at, at, at that point, are you already putting yourself at risk? That's one I'd have to think about because as far as like physically getting caught on these cameras, I haven't really had a lot of time and uh, to put into like figuring that out. Um, this and what I'm talking about today is literally just a primer. This is like the 101 remedial information you need to get into being a, the wearer of tinfoil hats, you know. Um, I do know that there is reflective clothing or clothing that you can purchase that will, when a, when a uh, photograph is taken, instead of you, it'll be a white blur. Uh, however, the only problem I will say with that is now you stand out even more. <laughs> <laughs> and one last one. Uh, yeah. Have you, had any, have you tried to automate any, any of the uh, uh, identity management stuff to manage all your different identities? I have not found a good way to automate it now. If anyone here wants to talk about automating my ID management, <laughs> please talk to me after this. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my time. Thank you all for coming out. I appreciate it.